Thank you for checking out Bible Roundtable. This is a program where we deal with issues and things that we face in the church and in life, and we're looking for Bible answers to those issues. My name's Brooks Boyd. I'm the moderator for this program, and I've got some good, sound, faithful gospel preachers with me today to help in our endeavor to find some of those answers. I'm going to let them introduce themselves at this time. Jerry, you go first. I'm Jerry Noblin, Sr. I preach for the Northside Church of Christ in Columbus, Georgia, and have for many years. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be moving back to my home state of Arkansas, though, in a few uh-huh. months and preaching for the Austin Church in Cabot. Arkansas. Right. But I appreciate the opportunity to be on the program here. Thank you for joining us. Steve? I'm Steve Rogers. I'm the minister of the Manchester Church of Christ in Manchester, Georgia. I've been there for uh, soon to be six years. Uh, it's my first full time preaching wow. job. Uh, I'm retired from the Army. Uh, Thank you for your service. We have, me and my wife have two daughters. Uh, and uh, our oldest daughter uh, just had a, a, a child, that, as you well know, yes, uh, she attends where you preach, and uh, right. they had their fourth child, and uh, everybody's doing wonderful, and we're glad to have another grandchild in the family. <laughs> and, uh, she is precious. She is. Yes, She's a ruby. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, certainly thankful that uh, you could be uh, with us today. In I the program, appreciate the opportunity. Gentlemen. Delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've got some issues that I think are very <coughs> current. Uh, this may be a little too general in its wording, but uh, I, I see this happening. I see this trend, and I just wonder. There's a great emphasis being placed in society, for sure, uh, on celebrating our diversity. And I just wonder, you know, is that getting into the church? or is there, Are there some things we need to be aware of? And, and is it... Is it something we need to consider to celebrate diversity uh, within the body of Christ? Uh, we're going to have contemporary uh, as opposed to traditional worship services or, or whatever might be related to that. Jerry, what do you think? Well, first of all, I think it's a very serious issue. Uh, there are those congregations of the Lord's people who want to be like the nations round about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Consequently, uh, the philosophy of the, a contemporary as in contrast or compared to the traditional worship you're talking about. The church of our Lord, the church of the New Testament, is distinctive, though. And when the church of our Lord loses its distinctiveness, it is my studied judgment that it no longer has a reason or right to exist. When the prophet in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, stated... Thus saith Jehovah, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk therein. Of course, they would state that they would not walk therein, and that's, that reminds us of what's going on in many instances, many times today. Um, if you'll forgive the personal reference, a brother and I had been to Canada just a few years ago, when we were coming back uh, from Canada and striving to find a faithful congregation of the Lord's people. And there are some in the New York area. Mm-hmm. We stopped over in Connecticut and called and called and called and finally uh, missed the morning service and came on to Virginia to find a faithful congregation. My wife and daughter and others, though, have gone back to visit uh, some in New York. And on more than one occasion, have gone into an assembly and had to get up and leave an assembly that said, the Church of Christ. Obviously no longer distinctive, having partaken of the ways of the religious world, the mm-hmm. Protestant religious world. Mm-hmm. That's not something to celebrate. That's something to be sad, sad about mm-hmm. because the Church of our Lord is indeed distinctive. One more thought, if I might. In Colossians 3, and verse 17, when the Bible says, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God the Father through Him. In the name of the Lord means by the authority of the Lord. That means if the Lord, what you do in religion must be authorized by the Lord. In word, that's what you say, and in deed, that's what you do. Do all in the name of the Lord. Uh, Brethren, have some of our brethren forgotten that? Do we no longer understand or realize that? That's a sad situation to me. Well, as someone responded to you on another occasion when you quoted a Bible verse, 
that's your interpretation. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I'm afraid that's the way some are looking at it. Well, it is, <laughs> but there has never been a, a uh, for lack of a better terminology, a bigger lie than this philosophy of the only reason we differ is it's just a matter of interpretation. You interpret you know, your way and I'll interpret it my way and we'll both go home to heaven when we die. The Bible doesn't say one thing to you or to someone else and then something different to me. It says the same to us all. And we're going to be judged by our interpretations and we surely need to remember that. But you've made a good point because that's exactly how some people get by with our differences. It makes a difference that we differ, doesn't it, no, in the religious world? Right. And, and we need to explain it. Uh, I'm going to let Steve talk because I think you may have had some experience with this. Uh, what's, your, what's your thinking about this idea? I, beginning in Genesis, <laughs> okay. all the way through Revelation, from page to, from cover to cover, we recognize this as the Word of God. Okay. And in doing so, God never left it up to man to determine how he would worship. It's exactly the case. Every single, in, as, as he was giving Moses the instructions for the, the tabernacle, he it makes sure that they, and I'm paraphrasing, make sure that they follow my instructions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make it according to the, the pattern. pattern. Uh, the pattern, the pattern. And when we look at patterns, there is, there is a specific pattern in the way we worship. And we must worship that way. We must worship in spirit and in truth. Exactly. We, and to, there's so much, <laughs> there's diversity because my, our people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Amen. Mm -hmm. They don't know. They don't know why that we don't use musical instruments in worship. They don't know, and when, the first thing I think of when they say uh, when, when we're going to have a contemporary service, that that's to me that just eeks of mm -hmm. instrumental music. It's getting there. It's right. getting and there. It's a like. step in that direction. And and some congregations in the that that advertise contemporary and traditional actually do have musical instruments within their worship, mm -hmm. musical instruments during the Lord's Supper on a Saturday, that's contemporary. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's beyond disobedience. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we have been given a prescribed manner of worship and we must hold fast. You're exactly right. Pattern. God has never allowed never. a man to do his own thing. He's never accepted worship. But you mentioned a moment, you know, that, but he has, himself is not prescribed. Yeah. But you mentioned that, that people don't know many instances. I surmise that in some instances people don't care. Mm -hmm. They want to do what they want to do. And they're not concerned about anything else. In fact, that's what liberalism really is about. Yeah. They're going to do their own thing. And that's mm -hmm. sad. Well, mm -hmm. I, I've, heard, I've heard brethren say, well, let's just, let's relax our service just a little bit so the people will come. And then once we get them there, they'll get used to coming and and then we can teach them the truth. Hmm. Really. It's, it's, really. Let's take 50 I, I, years to build goodwill with everybody and then we'll convert the world. But yeah. that's done been tried and it's that's done right. failed. That's right. I on the outset, I believe we need to t preach the word just as it is. <clears throat> Indeed. We need to worship just as we're commanded to. Must do so. We must call a spade a spade. We must identify sin as sin and correct worship as Indeed. correct worship. Indeed, very good. And not, and not back down one iota, not one. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, think about <laughs> the excuse for this. And I recall a book back before the turn of the 20th, 21st century, you know, The Church in Transition. Uh, and I know the brother that wrote it, uh, and uh, you know he, he had a a friend and brother that wrote the response to that in transition to what mm -hmm. uh, we, we see this this change in culture, and we think, well, there's never been anything like this before. But what was more diverse than the church in the first century, uh, being planted all over the world, where you have, have Jews and Gentiles worshiping together? 
They didn't celebrate diversity. They said, now you're one in Christ. You know, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians yeah, 12, 13, you, one spirit's baptized you into one body. And, and exactly. this one body does these things the same way. And, and well, I'm, I'm preaching now, but uh, 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 17, Paul said, everywhere in every church. Mm -hmm. It's not different in Corinth than, than in Jerusalem. It worship Yet, the same way. Brooks, all of those churches that you can read about in the New Testament have long been gone. Oh, yeah. They no longer exist and haven't existed for many, many centuries. We need to ask ourselves, why? Something changed. They had the right attitude. They had the enthusiasm, the zeal, the truth, the gospel. And yet, they are no longer. But there was false doctrine back then, as there is now. And many of them accepted that. They did indeed. And, and uh, as one brother wrote, uh, just one grape at a time. That's how a fox spoils a vineyard, yeah. you know. That's how the church is being spoiled. Just one principle at a time, mm -hmm. allowing that to change, to pacify, as you said, the community, uh, to get more people in. Well, if you get them in with that, what are you going to have to do to keep them? Yes. That's the question. How are you going to tell them that they have sin in their life if you're, if you're so busy worried about pleasing them? That's right. How, you, how, you, how do you do that? They don't go together, do they? Don't go together. <laughs> I, read, I read something about pleasing men somewhere. Did mm. it in Galatians 1? <laughs> I believe uh, you did. Mm -hmm. If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Mm -hmm. All right. Good answers, brethren. I appreciate that. And, uh, uh, this, is, this is along that same line. Uh, are there any biblical reasons, Steve, that women should not serve the Lord's Supper so long as men lead the prayers? No. Okay. <laughs> Good answer. Now, would you explain how that's no, going to play there, out? There's no, there's no reason for them to take part in the worship service. There's no example. We, we, we just talked to, with the last question about doing everything by example. Okay. And we do everything according to the pattern. There is no pattern of women taking a role in the worship service. Of course, there's no, pat, there's no pattern that you might say, well, that you, there's no pattern, of, there's no record of men passing the trays in the new, that, that's irregardless. It's the principle of the thing. It's the principle of why, 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 why should they? Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have a leadership role in the church other than teaching the younger women. That's a very, and as we've, as we see in, in the church today, that, that's a serious problem that, that needs to be addressed. The, the, we're losing our way day after day because there's not enough adequate and proper teaching for our young people. Uh, so if, <coughs> if, we, uh, if we stumble up on little questions like this that are trying to lead us astray and make us using a more contemporary, mm. Uh, if you look at the contemporary churches, they're, they're the ones that are doing things like this. Why do I want to be like them? Uh, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. Uh, may, we, may, we need to make distinctions with our, within our worship and within our, what we believe and what we teach and what we say. So there's, there, there's no biblical background for women to take part in the worship service, and there's no, uh, there's no reason for them to. Well, now, the question was, I know, is there I a reason for women not to serve? Yeah, there's every is reason. Is there any, any prohibition for them? It's you're, you're saying, yes, there's not an example to, yeah. that would allow them yeah. to do it. Yeah, I, I answered that question wrong. Mark, okay. mark me wrong on that. <laughs> 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 I, I misread it. Uh, no, there, there's, there's no, uh, yes, there's every reason not to allow that. Okay. Uh, every reason, every okay. biblical reason. I, I thought that's what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, Jerry, you want to add to that? When you... When you first gave me that question, the first time I read it, my very first thought was, why would a Christian woman want to do a thing of that nature? In light of her place, her position, and there are some, of course, who feel that uh, if a woman's in the position that you think she ought to be in, you know, in subjection to her husband, uh, learning in quietness, 1 Timothy 2, then, you know, you're, you're holding her back and that makes her second class. Mm -hmm. But that's absolutely not true. A woman is not second class because she's where God wants her to be. She's first class. Yeah. The most faithful people in all of the church of our Lord in many instances 
are godly women, mm -hmm. more so in many instances than many men are. And they stay in the place. Now somebody says, but you're talking about she has a place. Indeed, men have a place mm -hmm. too though. Okay. And Paul discussed it in the First Corinthian letter, stating that the head of every woman is man, but the head of every man is Christ. Mm -hmm. And when you've got that in order, you know, when you've got that the way it ought to be, there's no difficulty. But why would a woman, yeah. why would a woman want to do something of that nature? Mm -hmm. It could be because she's been drinking from the cup of the feminist movement yeah. and has been ignoring what the scriptures teach. The greatest thing in the world that ever happened, of course, to a man is a woman. God took care of that in the long ago when he made Eve for as a helpmate. We both need to stay in our places and do the things that we ought. And there's no reason, of course, ex exactly as you pointed out, no example. She is not to be in a leadership position, period. I'm talking about, of course, in the, in the assembly. There's some things. Uh, she can go out and buy a piece of land, as the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 did, mm -hmm. etc. But we're talking about the assembly and worship in the assembly. Yeah. Um, I think back to the Old Testament, and, and <laughs> the only reason that God had a woman leading in the days of, of the judges was because the, the men were too sorry, it looks Absolutely. like. Absolutely. You know, the, the, <laughs> the captain of the army said, I'll <coughs> go if you'll go with me, talking mm -hmm. to Deborah. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll go fight this battle that God wants me to fight as long as you, mm -hmm. this prophet, as you go with me. Uh, and so there would be occasions, I suppose, where there are no men present in the congregation uh, for some unusual reason. It happened in uh, World War II, I understand, in some of those circumstances. But when there are men present, then uh, step up and do the leading so the women won't feel like they need to. <laughs> if I might, I remember well years ago when we were students, I was a dab, I think, before you at Freed Hardeman. Just a little. I was a student at Freed Hardeman. <laughs> Uh, college in Henderson, Tennessee, then college, now university, went out to preach at a little place in Tennessee. And I had been warned by the preacher that was there before, he said, the women rule and run that church, period. Well, I found that very situation uh, existed. But the week before, it was a little bit better when I got there because the week before, the preacher who was visiting there with them at that day, preaching that day, said, I want to have a meeting with the men. And all the women stayed. He said, I want to have a meeting with the men of this congregation. And so he pointed to the door, and they went to the door and kept their heads stuck in the door. <laughs> now, this is, the most, this is a rare and a most unusual <laughs> circumstance. Yeah, yeah. But they intended, was it the women's fault? Of course, it was because the men were sorry, is what it amounted to. But an unusual circumstance, especially for a young preacher. <laughs> well, and a very good learning experience. Indeed. Sure. Indeed. <laughs> Anything else, Steve? No. I, I, well, yeah, I, I, a, a brother in Christ once asked me, does it matter if, if the woman passes the tray horizontally or vertically? <laughs> <laughs> Referring to if she can pass it down the pew why can't she pass it up the aisle? Mm -hmm. And I said, really? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's all about taking a leadership position. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you say, well, that's not a leadership. It's, it's, it's in essence not a leadership, but it's a part of the worship. And men perform the worship service. They lead it. That's they right. lead it. I, I was asked recently uh, to respond to the question or to the, to the statement, women should have a larger role in the church today. And my first response was larger than what? Larger than the Lord wants them to have because I think we've got what the Lord wants them to have. We're doing Absolutely. just fine with Amen. that. Good answer. All right. All right. Well, here's a, a matter of salvation. Uh, Jerry, how do you respond to someone who makes the claim that Mark 16, 16 does not say, he who is not baptized shall be lost, suggesting that baptism is not necessary then to salvation. This, in my judgment, is without a doubt, and I say this with love and care, but I don't intend for anybody to misunderstand me either, the use of this passage or what they do to this passage to get around the subject of baptism is without a doubt one of the sorriest 
and most dishonest approaches to Scripture that I've ever seen. And denominational preachers who do not believe baptism is essential have done it for years. But let's look at the passage briefly. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Now that's a complex declarative sentence, statement. Now, the he that believeth and is baptized is the complex subject. He is the simple subject. And it is modified by a restrictive clause that is baptized, but that believeth and is baptized. And he shall be saved is the principal sentence. Now, I know that these things are accurate because they've been tested on the polemic platform, of course, many, many times right. through many decades. Now let's look at it briefly. He shall be saved. What we need to find out is, who is the he that shall be saved? Is it the he that believeth shall be saved? No. Well, is it the he that is baptized shall be saved? No. Well, what is it? It is the he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Two things connected with a coordinating conjunction. The end result, of course, is salvation. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. But they come along and say, well, he doesn't mention he that is not baptized shall be lost. Does he have to do that? <laughs> you and I know the answer. And all I believe with all of my heart that there may be some honest people out there who've heard that objection, or who use it, I mean. But for the most part, you have to be dishonest with the Lord's statement to do a thing of that nature. Look at what this does. The Lord says, He that believeth and is baptized, he is the one who shall be saved. He told what to do to be saved. Now did he turn around in the latter part of the verse and say, in the same verse, mind you, in essence, it would be this. Now I told you in the first part of the verse what you've got to do to be saved. But I'm telling you in the last part of the verse that you don't have to do part of it to be saved. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. That's not only asinine, it's worse than ridiculous. Look at a, look at a uh, phrase that's similar. He that eateth and digesteth shall live. Mm -hmm. Does one have to say, he that eateth not and digesteth not shall die? We know there is no digestion if you don't eat. They're parallel. They're exact. But some people, and I say this with love and respect and care, respect to the point that we can, some people will do anything to get around the teaching of our Lord. And a man recently on our television broadcast back in Columbus for several weeks strove to prove that Mark 16 was not inspired. Mm. And so we dealt with that in detail. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it may be missing in some old manuscripts, but there's plenty of reason to, to know with that, without doubt that uh, Indeed. the Lord said it. Indeed. And it needs to be there. Indeed. So, Steve, how do you handle that uh, question? Well, uh, when, when you look at, the, and Jerry mentioned, he, he did a very good job explaining that <laughs> as far as the sentence structure. And he did a very good job on the TV. I watched him on the TV program last Sunday morning. I heard him respond to this. So, okay. but uh, came in just right, by the way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. But uh, when when you put that three-letter word between two other words, mm -hmm. it gives both sides of that word equal importance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And and I've heard uh, another analogy. If you get up and go to work, you will get paid. If you don't get up, you won't get paid. You, you don't have to go to work if you don't get up. You're not going to go to work. If, if exactly. He, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the whole story. That's the story within a story. Sure. That, that's, that's, and I think we lose sight of who said that. Mm -hmm. Good point. It was the Lord that said that. Absolutely. It wasn't a group of men. It wasn't a, a, a convention that established this point. It was the Lord himself, the one that died for me and for you and everyone else. Mm -hmm. It was the Lord's doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
when, if, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which uh, I say? Luke 6, 46. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, wh when, when, and then, and s s you, you make excuses for people that don't want to uh, uh, be baptized for the remission of sins? Are, are we going to do that? No. No. Mm. Not when it's the Lord's commandment. It, it, this, that is a command. It is indeed. If, and if, if Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says that when we're baptized into Christ, we clothe ourselves or we put on Christ. Yeah, right. So if we want to be in Christ, to be clothed with Christ, we must be baptized. And the, in his own direction, you have to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more thought, if I might, Brooks, okay. before you uh, comment on it. When the Lord said in verse 15, he that believeth, uh, or he's going to go preach the gospel, preach gospel. excuse me, to the right. whole world, he okay. that believeth, he's talking about the gospel. You've right. got to believe the gospel. So in the latter part of verse 16, he that believeth not means the person who doesn't believe the gospel, obviously. Yeah. He'll be condemned. Mm -hmm. A person who doesn't believe the gospel is not going, uh, he, he's not going to be concerned about baptism. Don't have to be. It's like I said, it is, a, it is a false doctrine that teaches what they do on Mark 16. Amen, amen. And, the end, and the end results in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, they will face the, the, those that do, not obey, that do not know God and obey, obey not the, the gospel. gospel. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I've, I've had a few opportunities to talk to people that, that have that way of thinking. It's... Yeah, I think it is something that uh, they've heard and it's been ingrained in them from their it is. denominational background. But I, I, when, they add, when they present that thought, I say, now which question are we trying to answer? What must I do to be saved or what must I do to be condemned? Mm -hmm. If Good I want to be saved, here's the yeah. answer. Either Good believe point. it and is baptized, shall be saved. If I want to be condemned, just don't believe. Absolutely. You don't have You're nothing exactly else matters. Right. You're exactly right. And without faith, there's no purpose to anything mm -hmm. anyway. So I'm sure that's something the Lord had in mind. But believing His Word, uh, just, just consider what people do when they refuse, when they reject the gospel of Christ. Uh, it's as if they're shaking their fist at God and saying, I don't care what you said. Mm -hmm. I don't want any part of what you're doing for me. Uh, and uh, they, they deserve the condemnation that uh, is promised in this passage by their rejection. Yeah, indeed. All right, brethren. Well, we're out of time here, but I do appreciate the, uh, the good experience and the good input that uh, we have at this table right now. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming and be a part of this program. Thank, thank you thank for you. inviting us. All right, and thank you to uh, the audience, all of you who are listening. Uh, it's our aim to be helpful, not harmful. Uh, and if you do have questions, uh, that we've already had some call-in questions on these matters, so feel free to address those to the Gospel Broadcasting Network.